we have to really escalate the noise we make so that we'll be heard. Welcome to a special edition of Gay USA. I'm Andy Hum. I'm Ann Northrup. And what do we have planned today, Ann? <laughs> well, clearly not enough because we're talking over each other. Uh, we have a special panel discussion. We brought in some of our favorite activists to spend the hour talking about their lives and their work and what it all means to them and how they got into it. Uh, we're looking forward to a very honest and inspiring conversation. It's sort of like a little support group for us. So let's bring in our guests. Yes. Uh, oh, yes, we have we have four of them. Uh, and uh, to get us started, why don't we all go around and introduce ourselves, starting with uh, Jay Walker. Uh, hi, everyone. Hi, Anne. Hi, Andy. Uh, it's great to be here. I'm J.W. Walker. Uh, I am a New York activist. I'm one of the founding members of Gays Against Guns and a co-founder of the Reclaim Pride Coalition Queer Liberation March. And uh, uh, Tanya A. Walker. I'm Tanya A. Walker. I am the co-founder of New York Tr Transgender Advocacy Group. And I'm also on the advisory board of Equality New York. And my old friend, Kathy Marino Thomas. I'm Kathy Marino Thomas, Emeritus Board President for Marriage Equality USA, founding member of Gays Against Guns, um, former co-chair of Equality New York, current uh, board member of the Gilbert Baker Foundation. And finally, our associate producer, Bill Ballman. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Bill Ballman. I was a uh, early member of the Gay Activist Alliance in the very early 70s, starting in 1972. Uh, I was a founding member of the Lavender Hill Mob, and then which led into being a founding member of ACT UP New York. And uh, one sort of built on the other, and I'm still involved and still do a lot of activism, particularly around treatment issues uh, in terms of getting better care for people with AIDS in New York and around the world. I'm Andy Hum. I started my gay activism when I went to a meeting of the uh, Gay Student Union at the University of Virginia. No one would run for president, so I did, and I've been an activist ever since. Uh, I'm Ann Northrup. First, I want to clear up that Jay Walker and Tanya Walker are not related. <laughs> We're all brothers and sisters. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Well, maybe, maybe you want to adopt each other. I don't know. But uh, I, for those who are wondering. We could be just uh, cousins. <laughs> uh, I've had a, a very varied life and happy to have stumbled into activism, uh, maybe first uh, against the Vietnam War and in the feminist uh, second wave movement. Uh, but I've been doing this kind of stuff for, you know what, 25, 35 years, 45 years. Uh, so we'll get into the details. Do I hear more? <laughs> yes. Uh, so let's talk about how we're feeling these days in the current uh, political environment, social environment, et cetera, what we're going through right now. Who wants to complain first? <laughs> <laughs> well, it does feel like the work never ends. I'll say that. <laughs> Well, really, I mean, uh, I talk to a lot of people who just think the uh, the end is near and uh, this country in particular and the world as a whole is headed in a very, very, very scary, bad direction. Is that how you feel or are you more optimistic than that? I think I was born more optimistic than that. <laughs> I'll never give up. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, uh, yeah, I mean, all of us uh, want to be optimistic and want to never give up, but uh, it's it feels pretty dire out there. Jay, what are you thinking? Uh, for, for me, I, um, I feel that we're in one of the worst moments that we have been uh, really since the Reagan administration. Uh, it's a very, very difficult moment in time. I think that the United States is a world power. I think that we've been in this sort of place of end of empire for quite some time. 
and it feels as though the, the Trump administration has kind of that, that period of Trump administration sort of jump started a more rapid decline. Um, but the, the flip side of that is that that energizes me. That just makes me want to get out and do more. That makes me want to amplify my voice, want to lift my voice, want to help others who feel the way that I do lift their voices. Um, and so I think that, you, that, that folks out there really um, should kind of take a, a, an inspiration from the dark times that we're living in to use them um, to, to spur them on to, to, to try to do more. Tanya, uh, I'm curious about your point of view because on the one hand, trans issues have come to the forefront in just the last few years in a way that I think none of us would have predicted, the, the explosive attention to trans issues. On the other hand, there is this immense cruelty and, uh, and viciousness against uh, trans people being uh, visited on us by the right wing. So uh, what's your assessment of where we are and where we're headed? Well, when I, I made a speech uh, for Equality New York, uh, when uh, the Trump administration first banned trans people from the military, and I said, uh, they're coming for us today, the trans people, they're coming for you tomorrow. And I believe I was right about what I said. I said, I, I said an attack on any of the letters in the LGBT community, it should be an attack on the whole community. Because um, I believe that, you know, that they're coming for everybody, especially after overturning, you know, uh, Roe v. Wade, you know, at the Supreme Court level. Um, I feel like more of our rights are in jeopardy of being uh, removed, uh, you know, with this Supreme Court we have. and. Uh, but but I believe that we we must still fight. I know that you know in 29 states currently, I believe it is in the United States, uh, LGBTQ folks still do, do not have protections. Uh, so uh, I I feel like we're in a very dangerous time. Um, I think that we are really going to have to. Uh, uh, energize folks around the country to get equality-minded folks uh, elected to office uh, so that uh, we, so that at least the 29 states in the United States can get LGBTQ protections into their constitution, state constitutions, so that, uh, you know, everyone will be protected and safe. But uh, the as far as trans issues are concerned, Specifically, most of the attacks around the country are against transgender children uh, who just want to live their lives and be themselves. Um, you know, there's documented medical evidence and mental health evidence that trans people do exist and that gender is in your mind and not in your genitals or genitalia. And uh, but folks still choose to ignore it. I, I, you know, I saw a back and forth with this professor the other day about uh, it was uh, with Josh Harley, the Republican, and it was this uh, professor, and they were going back, back and forth over uh, men getting pregnant, uh, which involved trans men, and so he, Josh Harley, said he didn't believe that men could get pregnant. So the professor said, "So you're denying that trans people exist." And they had a, you know, they went back and forth, uh, you know. So this is the kind of uh, stuff that's going on in society right now. It's um, people denying trans people the right to self-determine, uh, you know, their own identity. And I think it's a very dangerous precedent that that uh, that you know that the right wing is setting in this country. And we do have a picture of you uh, back in 2017 when Trump did reimpose a ban on uh, trans people in the military. I guess you're in Times Square there uh, yes. where, the, where the military recruiting center is. And in fact, like Jay, I see you out in the street and Kathy uh, and Bill all the time, uh, still out there. All I mean, you, I get tired just covering you. 
uh, because you're out there all the time. W you know, so you must have some hope that what you're doing is going to make some changes. You know, the tools are all there. The tools to fight for our own equality, they're all there. Um, this country is built uh, for the common person to succeed. We just have to believe it. Um, I continue to choose to believe it. You know, our legislators work for us. It's time that we demanded those changes. We need to, uh, for example, I went to deliver a, a, a petition yesterday to Senator Gillibrand's office with some folks from Demand Justice. There were about 10 of us. They wouldn't let us come upstairs to the office. That's unacceptable. They work for us. So I think my motivation is knowing the tools are there and knowing that we have the power to create change um, and to keep fighting for it. You know, democracy is an experiment. I don't want to. I don't want the experiment to fail. And well, you were you one say, of the prime. You were, excuse me. You were one of the prime movers behind marriage equality in this country. Uh, your your group, marriage equality. We have a picture of you back in 2013 down at, the, I believe, at the Supreme Court. Was you, I were the, you were the prime with your family, <laughs> yes, with okay, Sheila, right. and with your daughter. Um, you know, you were there um, behind the Windsor case, which won federal marriage rights for everybody. Uh, yeah. And and a lot of people scoffed at that back then, including movement leaders who said this can't be done. Don't ask for this. But you did it. Well, now we have to keep it. <laughs> well, when you talk about uh, the tools are there specifically, what are you talking about? We what have the right to approach our legislators. We have the right to meet with them, to uh, petition them, to do our bidding. We have so far, we still have the right to vote. Uh, <laughs> we have to hold on to that right. We have to read the Constitution and, and understand what our rights as citizens are. Um, we have the right to protest still. Uh, hopefully, we can. But I, 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 was, I, I was particularly distressed when you said that uh, Senator Gillibrand wouldn't meet with you. Uh, well, she particularly wasn't there. That's fine. But her okay. office would not let us come up to the office. Okay. Because, yeah, because I remember. Uh, back in the mid 80s to Lavender Hill Bob, uh, went to Alphonse D'Amato's office in New York and we had, we got ourselves into his office and uh, with members of the PWA coalition and uh, Michael Hirsch and J. Elizabeth Glass and several others. Mm -hmm. And we were demanding, we, we had petitions, actually an arrest warrant for Alphonse Tomato, 15,345 dead of AIDS. Uh, and we were charging him with neglect. And that's why we wanted to arrest him. But one of the things we found out very quickly, we figured we would go there and we'd raise a fuss and demand a meeting with Tomato. Uh, and thinking that we could then turn over the lobbying effort to GMHC and other groups like Lambda Legal Defense and Education Fund. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll break it, open the door, and then you could do the work of the hard edge uh, of the lobbying that needed to be done. But unfortunately, we found out that they weren't interested in doing the lobbying either. So we quickly had to educate ourselves so that we could do the lobbying with, with, their, with his office. And we, uh, that evening, uh, Marty Robinson, who was one of the people in the Lavender Hill Bob, got a phone call from Moynihan's office saying, well, how come you didn't take over our office? He's just as bad as D'Amato is on AIDS issues. And uh, so uh, we quickly developed a lobbying campaign with both of, of the health aides from D'Amato and Moynihan's office. One was named, uh, Rick Nasty, and the other one was, I forget his first name, his last name was Vile. So we immediately put out a press release saying the mob goes vile and nasty. You know. <laughs> well, this was a whole now, was a lot less contentious than that. These folks yeah. from uh, Demand Justice made an actual appointment and told them what we were coming there to do. And it was to simply drop off uh, a petition of over 10,000 signatures asking Senator Gillibrand to consider signing on to a bill to expand the court, which unfortunately I, I believe is one of our it is a tool that we can use uh, given to us in the, in, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the uh, Judiciary makeup Act. Of our, makeup of our government. Um, but we, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's. But it's would she be, 
it's a tough sell. I agree with all of that, but it is an option. And I think it's one of the only options we have as far as the Supreme Court goes. But anyway, we were only there to deliver a petition and ask her to consider signing on because she's not a co-sponsor of that bill. Um, so it wasn't very contentious at all and they still wouldn't let us in and that was very disturbing. To me. So what yeah. did you end up doing? You know, the girl came down, she took the petitions, we tried to get a picture of her and they, they said they would regroup. It wasn't, I was a participant. Um, I'm, I'm now going to, I've signed on to be more involved in pushing her to listen to uh, the opinion of that. Um, I just showed up as a participant because I never did anything with them before. So up until that moment, nothing else. But now I will. <laughs> now, Jay and, and Kathy, I see you all at the I see you all at the Gays Against Guns demonstrations. Any time there is a mass shooting in this country, you are out there on the street. You, you I mean, it, I mean, it, you show you're the first ones to show up in New York uh, as opposed to and you do have coalitions with other groups. What? Different difference do you feel you're making by showing up like that? And I mean, what sense do you have it's changing? <clears throat> Pardon me. Honestly, we you know we made a decision very early on when Gays Against Guns was formed to uh, uh, whenever there is a mass shooting with ten or more fatalities that we would get out to the streets uh, within twenty four to forty eight hours to give. Our, to give our community, to give our new, our wider New York community an opportunity to say, you know, no, this must stop, to take a stand against it, to let people know that people are not just sort of reading the headlines and then moving on with their lives. You know, that's, that's the value of that sort of direct action protest, holding demonstrations for, for things that you really don't have any control over as, as individual citizens. You're not gonna, you know, something's horrible, horrific has already happened. You don't want it to happen again. Um, you know, you're not at an election point, so it's, you know, it's not a campaign, an, an electoral campaign issue per se that's pressing right then and there. It's just to inform the dialogue, to inform the way that, that media coverage um, uh, covers these, you know, covers these, these cases, um, you know, but, you know, we see that, uh, a, you know, a few well-placed or poorly placed, you know, depending on how you look at it, justices on the Supreme Court um, can sort of overrule all of electoral politics, you know, and I agree with Kathy that, um, you know, at, you know, on the left, um, we, you know, not even, you know, beholden to one political party or another, we have to do um, massive, massive outreach and uh, encouragement uh, on the issue of expanding the court. There's a very simple reason, you know, there are, there are 13 um, circuits. There used to be nine circuits. We had one justice for each circuit. One there used to be six circuits when Washington was president. When Washington was president, right. But yeah, but you know, the circuits have expanded from nine to 13. So now we have five justices or four justices that each oversee two circuits, okay? And that's an imbalance right there. There needs to be one justice per circuit. So just, just on that, not even talking about politics. All right, but this raises the question of how we are gonna get power. The other side is very good to grab it and use the, our very uh, arcane constitution to hold power. How are, we're good on the issues. People agree with us on most of these issues that we're talking about, uh, but how are we gonna get power? Stagecraft, that's what we're missing. That's what the left has been missing for decades. The right knows how to create a narrative, to, make, to, to create that drama, to, to hit people at, their, at, at a really core emotional level. Democrats, the, le the left, tends to be more cerebral. We're like, we have all the facts, we have the data, we have all the information, this is basic logic, you should get this. That does not work. You have to hit people at their core. You have to hit them in their gut. And the right knows how to do that, and the left still has not learned how to do it. Well, it really just stresses me that a room full of dead school children didn't do that. <laughs> yeah, you would think, right? I mean... <laughs> or several, several rooms full of dead school children stretching out over decades. What greatly concerns me... What? Tanya, Tanya. Tanya, yeah. go ahead. You're, we can't hear you. Wait, we've, lo we've lost your sound, Tanya. Are you on mute? Yeah, I'm okay. sorry. We need more shows like Gay USA and more left-leaning shows like The Right. The Right has uh, hundreds of uh, shows 
uh, or you know, radio broadcasts that come on every day and they uh, shape the opinions and minds of their, of their folks. Um, we, 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 we don't have enough shows. We don't have enough talk radio. We don't have enough folks on the left leading and, and really pouncing on the right's uh, misinformation campaign. Because that's what we need to attack. We need to attack it with the truth. Like Gay, gay USA, we need more shows like you. Well, that's well, what I'll never about. turn down that uh, assessment. But, which, uh, which, is, which is one of the reasons why I, I, I work with Anne and Andy, uh, because I believe in the work that they're doing and want to support them every way I can. But at the same time, I don't see our community is organized. Uh, going back to 1972, there were over 35 gay activist organizations in New York State alone. There were at least a dozen to 20 in New York City, and we worked in coalitions. We had, we had regular meetings in New York City amongst all the New York-based groups, and then we had uh, statewide meetings of all the activist organizations. And not only were we working together with each other, I mean, it got contentious at times from here and there, but at the same time, we were also building wider coalitions with other, with other groups. Uh, you know, we, we had a great respect and, and uh, affiliate, affiliation with uh, the Black Panthers, with the Young Lords in New York. Uh, and uh, we, I don't see that today. I don't, I don't see that we, GAA, there were about, as I said, about 35 chapters in New York State and many chapters throughout the world, many of which adopted the same constitution that Arthur Evans wrote for, the, for GAA. And these were not just, you know, paper tigers. These were real organizations that met and grappled with issues and staged actions. And I don't see that happening today. And I really think that we're letting the ball drop in terms of not making that happen today, because we need it now more, more than ever. I, if, I, if, I could add, if I could add in really, really quickly, and the, the interesting, because that's a really good point that you made, Bill, and the interesting thing is, we see that and we have seen that for the last five years in the streets. Okay, the you know the Trump administration was the biggest aggregator of all of these different movements from the left that had been siloed, like during the Reagan years and in the nineties on that had gotten siloed. The Trump administration brought us all back, brought us all together in a really powerful way, but seemingly only in the streets, like in the places where 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 big policy strategy that informs political campaigns, that informs um, legislation being written, that's where it wasn't happening. And so I, I absolutely agree with you that on that level, it, it's, it, it's sorely missing. So how do we bring it back to a personal, you know, type of interplay where we see each other and we work together with, a com with common goals. Well, that's a question I have for sort of all of you. I mean, this has been a tough time with the pandemic and thing. How do you get together? How do you organize? Uh, is it just online? Uh, how do you do it and how do you support each other? Well, I think some groups are trying to get back to in-person uh, meetings and stuff, but honestly, the pandemic has turned on a new way for us to organize with one another and that is to use our online resources. It's infinitely easier now to get a whole state of people involved in stuff um, because we can have a meeting uh, online with those people. And I think a lot of organizations are trying to work that out. You know, it, it's the grassroots job to keep these issues in the news and to keep ourselves connected to one another. That's that's a gra that's a grassroots organizations reason for existing, right? In my mind. Um, so we, I think we took a hit at the beginning of the pandemic on how to do that. But I think that we're beginning to learn how to use our new tools. Right. I believe that we're gonna, yeah, we're gonna have to have, you know, we're gonna have to be in the streets. We're gonna have to be online um, and we're gonna have to get organized with uh, other groups uh, like uh, transgender groups are gonna have to organize with uh, maybe, uh, maybe a Black Lives Matter group or a, a, a woman's group, you know, a women's group or a lesbian group. 
we're all going to have to join forces or even immigrants group you know you know folks fighting for immigration or immigrant groups we need to all join forces and band together uh, and find common ground and fight for human rights well because i think that's it tanya i think that's it i think the starting point is to find all of these groups and all of these issues that now we find on the line now since Roe has been overturned, right? We need to boil it down to what the commonality is for all of us. And the commonality is our our equal existence, right? Um, and there's there's a there's gotta be like a like a I hate to use the word slogan, but I will because you know it's the only word coming to mind right now. Something that re- that really speaks to all of these issues to abortion rights and marriage rights and, you know, uh, uh, employment rights and everything that we all feel is on the line, which suspiciously interracial marriage doesn't seem to come up. It could be because a certain justice would really personally suffer from that. But, you know, I digress for into another whole section of conversation, right? Um, but I think that what what is really important right now for grassroots groups to do is find that commonality and find it quick because it's all at stake. And I believe that expanding the court could be one of those commonalities that we could all come together and work on, knowing that would help all of these issues. Well, I think that uh, that sloganeering, that commonality you talk about is what Jay was talking about and the need for a more visceral, uh, uh, aggressive approach that that is more human and less cerebral. Uh, and I think the the right has found it in their use of uh, groomers and pedophiles. You know <laughs> that boom, they just devastated us across the board with two words. Uh, so uh, we certainly have to counter that. And of course, the right wing is uh, very happy to lie all day long to uh, inspire their people. And what Tanya said about the the media and that. There, Fox News really, truly has changed the world uh, by offering them that uh, that venue that lies and uh, supports them. Right. They don't. They don't. They don't have it in Britain, by the way. They don't have that kind of Fox News, and that's how they. I think they were. They were able to get rid of Boris Johnson, and we we haven't been able to sink Trump permanently. Um, but you know, what, I mean, what, what one of the things that concerns me is is well, they have no. Honor. No, 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 no lack of desire to lie and change the change the message from day to day to day to day or to drive particular lies home. And if they get caught in that lie, they just tell another lie or they just repeat the same lie. We have the truth on our side. And, you know, uh, we don't have to lie. We just have to drive home those messages and, and drive home those me- messages effectively. And I don't think that uh, whenever there is something, a crisis that happens in the news, like a, like a shooting at, at a school or whatever, that simply uh, doing a, a big demonstration the next day is the answer. It really needs to be an ongoing day to day to day to day, constantly pushing the levers that we know need to be pushed to achieve the goals we want to see made well didn't that happen in new york didn't that happen in new york state immediately responding with more more gun safety legislation uh jay um yeah i think that uh the legislature and and the governor did a, a really good job of responding to that um that supreme court decision as best as best they could i mean there were certain things that you know once the supreme court you know, decides that certain things are not constitutional. There's, you know, there's nothing you can do about it and without expanding the court. But they managed, I think that they did a really good job of anticipating this decision. And, uh, and, and you know, they already had, you know, legislation in process, in the process of being written, um, you know, ready to sort of, you know, go to the, go to the debate stage and, and getting enacted. So, I mean, I, I definitely give kudos to New York for, for that work. And a few other states, Delaware, California, um, have, have had some really good responses to um, the Supreme Court piece. But what I would say is that, um, to go back to what Bill said, is that when you are telling a lie, 
you have it there's an innate understanding that you have to embellish it that you have to that you have to build it up that you have to give it all the bells and whistles necessary to push it into people's minds to push it into their subconscious and to you know to, to, to get it to catch hold and the problem is that when you're telling the truth the natural inclination is to just tell the truth and not feel that way not feel that you have to add all of that at all of the, you know, all of the, all of the, the bells and whistles, and the truth is that we we have to do that. We have to start learning how to add all that filigree. It, like Kathy said about getting, you know, getting those those catchphrases, those you know, the slow that sloganeering to to get it to sort of latch onto people's subconsciouses. You know, that's the kind of thing that we that we need to do. You know, in that in that activist space and that advocacy space, um, but also in a coordinated effort. Like we, you know, the way that the resistance worked was so powerful because you had environmental uh, environmental people talking with disability uh, uh, you know, advocates and activists talking with gun violence prevention, uh, talking with LGBTQ, like all of these different folks were informing each other's narratives and informing how, you know, how messaging was getting out, but it was mostly on the activist street level, it wasn't in the sort of corridors of power. And we've got to figure out a more effective way of, 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 of heightening that sort of coordination. But uh, Jay, whoever's got their phone going, but, but Jay, you, you talked about, well, you, we can only do whatever the Supreme Court lets us do. What about nullification? Now that's a dirty word. This is what the South did for mm -hmm. 100 years after the 14th Amendment was passed. They ignored it. They had Jim Crow. It was horrible. Mm -hmm. Now, if they're going to start imposing things, denying women's rights, uh, denying LGBTQ rights, all these things, uh, can't the states just stand up and say, you have no authority here over this. We are not going to follow those dictates. Well, the problem is that those sta that the states that would do that are the states that already are already are doing you know are already are doing that through the laws that they're passing right but you're not going to get alabama and florida and texas and all of these other republican controlled states tonight the problem isn't about right now isn't about the ability of a woman in new york uh to um right. to have access to uh, abortion services that's not the problem you know the problem is that the woman in alabama can't and Alabama is not going to do anything to nullify the Supreme Court decision. They're going to do everything in their power to reinforce it. So you know, in you, in, in that's the that's the issue that we have. We we have the reverse issue of of you know what you were talking about. Um, you know, after after Reconstruction, where uh, the the court is in support of the denial of rights, and all of those states of the old Confederacy are are, are super happy with it. Well, right, but what, what, the court didn't say abortion is outlawed. The court said the right. states can decide state to state what they want to do, and they are allowed to outlaw it. And therefore, when you have Republicans in charge in half the states, then you wind up with this situation. I want to ask, because uh, we've sort of said it here and there, we are the majority. Uh, Poll after poll after poll shows that the American people uh, agree with a progressive point of view, agrees with us on the issues. And the point, the problem is not that we don't have the majority, it's that we have abdicated power with apathy. We don't vote enough. We don't, we allow right wingers to take over school boards or state legislatures with gerrymandering or with uh, 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 very low vote totals uh, from right wingers who are more dedicated to voting. If we could energize uh, the true majorities, uh, we wouldn't be having these problems, but we have not energized them and they are sitting home doing nothing. Well, that's what I meant about boiling it down to a commonality. And I think that part of the grassroots toolbox is to say those things and continually bring those things up constantly. It is going to take going to tough areas in the country. It is. Um, and some of us have to be willing to do that. Jay, pack a bag. Uh, <laughs> we're going on a trip. Um, freedom rides. Are we back to freedom rides? Exactly. Yes, and I don't think I, I don't think I, I think that there's some 
there's some merit to that, Anne. I really think that that it may have to get that basic. As sure. far as the lies they tell about us, you know, uh, in when we were fighting for marriage equality, we quickly figured out that they talk about us being pedophiles. We show them our families. They talk about us being, you know, less than less than honorable. We show them our families. And the more we show them our families, the less validity all those lies had. And we're going to have to do the same here. Well, I, I I, 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 re I, rem I remember in, in the Activist Alliance in the early 70s, we went around the country. Uh, we went to the Midwest, we went to the South, and uh, we helped organize in those places. Yeah. Uh, and we got to meet people who were doing work in the grassroots in, in Lexington, Kentucky, in Columbus, Ohio, uh, right. in different parts of the South. And at, at the same time, the uh, ACT UP did the, the exact same thing. We traveled the world. I mean, people complain about the jet set activism that uh, people uh, went on these uh, trips, but like we were organizing around the world. We were organizing throughout the United States. And uh, it wasn't just a matter of like two or three people going to, going to a conference. We sent a full airplane full of people to Atlanta, right. Georgia. Right. And, uh, you know, and those things made a difference. And, and one of the things that, you know, I kind of sense a little bit from the activist community today is this fear of lobbying that GA everything on the computer. G, on the G, G, GA was not afraid to meet with politicians. Uh, ACT UP was not afraid to sit down and have a meeting with Tony Fauci or meet with a pharmaceutical company. And, and those kind of efforts led to faster approval of drugs that cut the dying down dramatically in 1995 and also got drugged to people through expanded access programs that would not have happened unless we rolled up our sleeves and went to dinner with these motherfuckers and the same thing demanded now. that change. They had language, Bill. All right. Uh -huh. yeah, and well, that's right. Like that. right. We're in yeah. the we're in the we're in a, a very apathetic state in our in our section of the world, not the right side, but the left. And it has to change. We have to get the fire under people again. They want a few things. Things are going right. Let me go home. It happened with marriage equality. But with mm -hmm. many marriage advocates left many LGBTQI rights on the table mm -hmm. because well, they gave know. marriage and they went home. And it's the same thing over and over again in, in in our liberal world. They make a few. Obama was president for eight years. Good things. Some good things got done. Wonderful. We're on the right road. I can go home and relax now. No. You know, what I want to talk about is, uh, you know, data collection, uh, adding to Kathy's toolbox. We do not have accurate data connect co collection or information about the whole LGBTQ community in this country. Um, we don't, uh, and everyone's identity is not included in this data. Um, and it's, and, and when you're fighting back, you need the data to back you up when you're going and you're, you're going into the offices of elected officials, uh, you know, around the country. And even here in New York, you need data to back up your, uh, your story or to back up, you know, what you're fighting for. And currently, uh, a lot of TGNC and B folks or transgender non-conforming non-binary folks are their identities are not in the data. So if we're not in the data, we don't exist. Well, and Tanya, I Tanya, I got a call from Carolyn Maloney in the Congress, and she said, Are you gonna talk about the data collection bill that I just got passed in the House? And I said, Is does it is anybody gonna bring it through the Senate? And no. Uh, and and then in New York City, we passed data collection. Danny Drum in the city council, yeah. and then the agencies just are too embarrassed to ask the questions. So this is a this is a tough fight, and you're right. It, 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 we need yeah, and we need this data collection. Um, we don't know how many uh, LGBTQ folks caught COVID. We don't know how many died from COVID. We don't know how many new HIV infections we have. We don't know uh, you know we don't know a lot about our community. And when we're fighting the right, uh, we need to be able to back it up with data as well. 
Well, I'd like to back it up a little bit here because uh, there's a question I wanted to ask bringing you together. What ins- I mean, you've been doing this for decades, each one of you for decades. What inspired you to become an activist? What inspired me was um, at, well, I was with, I saw ACT UP, I think it was 86 or 87, um, and they were, and we were marching, we were near, you know, they were marching in a parade, and I saw them marching, and they were holding signs, and they were really rowdy and loud and looked like they were having fun. And so I jumped into the parade and back in the days when you could just walk in, and uh, I marched with them. And when we got to St. Pat's Cathedral, everybody was pointing, yelling, shame, 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 because they were uh, anti-abortion and they were anti-gay. At that time, there was no transgender or anything like that. So, you know, they were when, anti- I, I, when I got into activism, I was fighting for a white Jewish lesbian judge, Judge Karen Burstein who was running for attorney general of New York State in 1994. Uh, um, And and Guy B. Molinari, the borough president of Staten Island, uh, felt like she wasn't fit to serve because she was a woman and she was an out lesbian. So I organized a rally at the College of Staten Island because I was head of the gay organization there. And I I had already transitioned and everything. And... I uh, it was about five of us out there. Everybody else was scared to to get out there and rally with us. And I held up a sign, gays and lesbians live in your borough too. And shortly after I was run off the college of Staten Island wow. for fighting for the rights, for gay rights. And this is in 1994. And I was fighting for a lesbian and I felt like, you know, I, I you know, we didn't have all these letters and all that back then, but I would do it to this day. I would and fight it is fun. Into this day, <laughs> and it is fun, Tanya. I, I hope that's what we've all found in activism. Uh, Bill, talk about what got you into activism. Well, it's like I was reading back in 1970 and 71. I was reading in the Village Voice, and even in Variety, Ron Gold, who was a member of uh, the Gay Activist Alliance, was writing for Variety. Uh, entertainment magazine, uh, newspaper. Uh, so from that source and other sources I was reading, I was hearing about this movement. And I figured, Bill, you're about 20 years old. It's like, don't you think it's about time that you pay your dues? <laughs> and, and I figured, okay, I will seek out the organization that's making these headlines. And I would dedicate about a year of my life and then I could move on and and quit the movement uh 42 <laughs> years later here I am 52 52 years 52 later. thank you thank you oh, thank you quit the movement that's hilarious wow. so, yeah yeah I, 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 it, it, amazingly amazingly the you know I'm now part of a coalition of uh, people who were involved with the gay activist alliance in the early 70s and we're doing uh, every other month, we're doing Zoom meetings. And uh, every single one of the people who is a part of these Zoom calls say how dramatically having been a member of GAA changed their lives forever. That their life was changed and everything they did from that point on was either uh, inspired by uh, uh, informed by or motivated by what they did in GAA, even if they were only involved for what I'd hope would be a year or two. How about you, Jay? Um, I, don't, I know yeah. you for a long time, but I don't know how you got started. Yeah, for me, um, it, it started with volunteering at um, GMHC in, uh, in the late 90s. Uh, I was a policy volunteer. Um, with GMHC and uh, from like 97, 98. And that October of 98, uh, the Matthew Shepard incident occurred. And, uh, you know, he was uh, left to die. Uh, it hit the headlines. Uh, then when he finally died, there was a large political funeral held for him. And at that political funeral, the NYPD charged uh, the protesters with their with their horses and, you know, injured a bunch of people and beat people and 
And I didn't participate in that political funeral, but there was a meeting at the LGBT center uh, when it was temporarily on Little West 12th Street. Uh, and I uh, heard about it you know, through the work I was doing at GMHC and I went to that meeting and out of that came a group called the October 19th Coalition. And that was really the first activist group that, uh, that I was a part of. Uh, and so I did that work on hate crimes issues um, for a few, for a couple of years after that, uh, the New York State passed uh, their hate crimes law, uh, which uh, now, in hindsight, uh, <laughs> a lot of us who participated in that realized how that law has been perverted and racialized and you know used uh, against even uh, LGBTQ people of color. Uh, you know, in, in uh, you know, in regards to um, uh, in, you know, violent encounters with uh, white LGBTQ people. Uh, so you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. But um, you know, it's it, that. But that 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 knowledge has informed you know the the way that uh, I think I look at um, you know the work that I'm doing now, just to always you know sort of keep that in mind uh, about uh, the, the bad consequences of good intentions. Um, when we're talking and we're advocating for 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 strong policies, um, you know, and definitely it's come up, uh, you know, in the work that I do presently. Kathy, what was your first time? <laughs> um, I was an AIDS buddy. The very first time I volunteered to do anything in our community, I was uh, watching my gay male friends get sick, and none of my lesbian friends were getting sick. I just felt like we should do something. And I called GMHC, Jay, mm -hmm. and went there and they had this great program called the Buddy Program and I joined and I got a lot of training through them and more experience, the hard, it still remains the hardest volunteer job I ever had in my, career, in my 30 years or more, I think, of doing this kind of stuff. Um, and it was really, it was very hard, but it was very rewarding to help people in that way. Um, it was very personal. We helped all kinds of people. And then my now wife, Sheila and I got together and she had this dream of the family and the house and, you know, let's have kids and all that kind of stuff. And it bothered me that we would not have any legal protection. That's when I learned about the burning sensation and when I get the burning sensation, I must get up and do something about it. It was the second time. The first was with AIDS and the second was with marriage equality. And we looked all over the city for a group that might, you know, possibly think that marriage was, you know, possible. And we found them in Marriage Equality New York. And there were six members when we found them <laughs> only. And they were Robert Voorhees, Michael Sabatino, Connie Ress, James Loney, Jesus LeBron, you know, and me and Sheila, <laughs> six, seven. <laughs> and um, we had a lot of conversations and we reviewed some legal precedents that we had found. None of us were attorneys. Then we found Evan and Freedom to Marry. But we didn't think that just going through the, lo the legal channels was going to be enough, that it needed a grassroots element. And we developed that grassroots element. Um, and over the next 17 years, I went from volunteer to board president, and then we married with our group in California. By that point in history, other groups believed marriage was possible. And, you know, the movement grew and the grassroots element became more important. And then we won. Edie Windsor came into our lives, the perfect case. Um, she was actually a Marriage Equality New York member. Um, initially, and uh, we saw the possibilities. We want, when we won in Massachusetts in 20, 2004, we saw that it was possible. It, it energized the movement. So the long story short is, from that point on, I discovered my power as an activist and that we could make change. It was hard work, it was dedication, but it was possible. And that has driven me ever since. That burning sensation came up again when Pulse was devastated. I felt like I needed to get up and do something. And I joined Jay 
at that meeting at the center where a, a gentleman named Kevin Herzog rented a room for 60 people and 300 people showed up and Gays Against Guns was born on that night. Um, you know, and all through all these years, I've realized that our power as grassroots activists to get up on a stage and get that microphone and say the truth and speak it and give it power was very moving and really could create change. What about you, Ann Northrup? Oh, I was going to ask you. <laughs> well, I mean, look, I told you, I went to that meeting of the Gay Student Union and I wasn't an activist and I became the president of the group. And it was so thrilling to step out and stand up for myself and not be hiding anymore. I'd already gone to gay bars and things and I'd had a closeted relationship, but that was thrilling. And I, I from that point on, that was my activism, but I actually think it goes earlier. I'm a white boy from the suburbs. I think be just being gay, realizing that I was different gave me some sensitivity that I would not have otherwise had to other people who were getting hurt, oppressed, bullied, and all those things. Uh, and thrilling and what Tanya said about it looking fun are key uh, points for me too. Uh, I'm the oldest one here and I vividly remember my suburban Republican childhood uh, my parents were Republicans. Uh, I'm not claiming that title. But I would sit at home and watch the civil rights movement on television. I saw those uh, police dogs uh, attacking uh, demonstrators and the fire hoses. And, and that was hugely uh, compelling to me as a sign of injustice. And that was in my, you know, early teens and or even earlier. Uh, and then as I went off to college, the Vietnam War was the big item. And I then got involved just tangentially as a protester against the war, taking part in uh, street demonstrations. Uh, and then I embarked on and uh, feminism, uh, second wave feminism. I, I was in the first women's march down Fifth Avenue in 1970 uh, and involved with the, the movement then. But then I embarked on a mainstream journalism career until I saw how empty that was and got fed up and ended up going to work for Andy. And <laughs> that became the Hetrick Martin uh, Institute, working with uh, uh, kids doing AIDS education and being, hi, I'm your local lesbian and working there with movement leaders at that agency, that small agency, uh, I quickly, I'd been out for 10 years, but I suddenly was in the midst of the movement and heard about ACT UP and went to a meeting and realized these are my people. They're going out in the street and demonstrating and it brought back to me all my anti-war and feminist uh, days and I plunged in because it looked fun and thrilling, Tanya. Yes. Yeah, there's, oh, yeah. there's a smile. Love that, love that picture. <laughs> 1997 St. Patrick's Day parade protesting our exclusion. Yeah. Wow. Well, I, I have enjoyed all my arrests, about 20 of them. I enjoy having been convicted on four counts for uh, demonstrating inside St. Patrick's Cathedral. And I've met the best people in the world doing this work all these years. I wouldn't trade them for anything. They are all, you're all my lifelong friends. And it's so much more interesting and so much more fun than working for CBS News with all the stars. Uh, and I just, I, I can't imagine anything more compelling and gratifying uh, than to do this work. And. And it is fun work. And I, you know, people thank me for the work I do. And I say, I do it for me. I do it because it feels so good and it's so fascinating. And the fact that it has uh, great effects in the world is icing on the cake. I am, I am lucky to be able to do this work. Uh, thrilled to have stumbled into it and uh, couldn't be happier. Doing well, Anne, you, sat, you started the show off in a, in a note of despair, so let's end on some notes of hope. What gives you, very briefly, because we're down to our last four minutes, what gives you most hope out there? Uh, for me, it's the young people I see fighting back against things like the don't say gay laws around the country, the demonstrations they're doing in schools, the way they're refusing uh, oppression. So I, I am hoping that they will be our uh, saviors down the road. 
any other hope out there? <laughs> I'll just re I'll just reiterate Anne's because um, this uh, this you know is as much as we sometimes have issues with with Zoomers, <laughs> um, these the kids that are really out there doing this work, they're doing it on all these fronts. They're doing it in the gun violence prevention movement. They're doing it in the environmental movement. They're doing it in the um, LGBTQIA2S movement. Across the board, this younger generation is so engaged and engaged so much earlier um, that it really does give me a great deal of hope. I agree with you, Jay. My daughter's 22 now, and when I hear her and her friends talk about politics with passion, they're involved, they understand who's running, why they're running, they understand the strategy of, of uh, supporting a candidate that believes in your, in your core values. Um, it inspires me. It gives me the reason to continue. Um, we need to give them our tools and empower them to carry on the fight because uh, apparently we need all the help we can get. <laughs> well, I suspect they learned a lot of that from their mothers, Kat. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you know, some kids don't don't uh, gravitate towards the things that interest their parents. Lucky for me, she's not only politically engaged, but queer identified, yay me. <laughs> yay. Tanya, what do you think? oh, sorry. Bill, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I just wanted to throw uh, one last little issue in there, and that is AIDS. Uh, it, AIDS is not over. Uh, there is no cure around the corner. As, as much as AMFAR sends out email blasts almost every day, sometimes two or three times a day, that we're so close to having a cure, we are nowhere near close. We're no closer than we were 25 years ago. And uh, we're uh, ignoring long-term survivors who are dying every day because they're not getting the kind of quality of care that they deserve. And I think, I think we need to address that as a community in, 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 in greater detail. It's and an important, work important point. Uh, Tanya, uh, I know you're the community we could argue was most under assault these days. So what's, what makes you hopeful? What makes me hopeful uh, is that, you know, we have uh, more and more youth uh, ident uh, uh, who are TGNCNB or trans transgender, gender nonconforming, non-binary, who are, who, who uh, know who they are at younger and younger ages. And uh, uh, some of them are finding themselves in activism currently. Um, and there's uh, more acceptance, you know, in schools now from their. And classes. we're out, and we're out of time, so we're going to stop. And it sounds like we've got to have some young people on this show. Yes, <laughs> yes. Thank you all for being Jay, Kathy, Bill, Tanya, and Dan. And Andy. Thank you <laughs> Thank all. You, Andy. Thank you all.